Hello, BillWhittle.com members and non-members alike. I'm Steve Green with Bill Whittle and Scott Ott, and this is your Right Angle Lightning Round, brought to you, as always, by our actual members, but now made public for everybody because, well, you probably did something to deserve this. We just don't know what. So if you're not familiar with the lightning round, instead of going deep into one story where we've already kind of hashed out backstage what we want to say, I have selected secretly two stories each for Bill and Scott. I'm going to hit them with these, and we are going to get their hottest, freshest takes on these important news items of dubious merit. So without further ado, uh, Scott, according to my notes, we're starting with you this week. A group, this is, oh, this was from Minnesota. A group says student was banned from competing in a swimming tournament despite following quarantine guidelines. The young athlete quarantined for 11 days, got tested twice, both tests coming back negative after receiving notice of his potential exposure. Um, I looked into this one because my first thought was, well, you know, maybe the kid may have had some attitude thing. Maybe he didn't follow the quarantine procedures or anything like that. But he absolutely followed the rules. They disqualified him from competing anyway. And my question to you, Scott, is if we're going to have these rules, and I understand we need some of these rules to protect uh, our most vulnerable from this, this really nasty virus, shouldn't we incentivize actually following the rules instead of punishing people for following these rules? Do you have any clarity on what it was they said he didn't do right? No, uh, they said he did everything right, but they just decided that to change the rules and say 11 day quarantine, we know is what we said, but now we're saying 14 and you didn't do that. Bye bye. Wow. Yeah. I would say when they finally let him return to competition, um, instead of lining up on that little springboard at the end of the pool like he normally does, I'm just, I would have him just line up on the cement by the side of the pool, you know, off to the away from the water, and get into a starting position so that when the gun goes off, he's actually going to run instead of swim, and just explain to them <laughs> that he changed the rules of how the competition is conducted. Perfect. Because he th- thought it would work better. <laughs> Uh, you know, th- this mystifies me, and I and I always assume that there's like more to the story that I'm hearing, but apparently there's there's nothing more. I think it, part of the frustration that some people have had with the various protocols of how we're to conduct ourselves in public places um, in the last year or so ha- has been that inconsistency of, okay, now you can do this, but now you can't do that. Um, you know, we had a lot of uh, people after the governor of Texas announced that uh, the state would no longer, you know, sort of be the the, uh, the mandator of masks, but he said local businesses can make up their own rules of how they conduct themselves. Well, <clears throat> That caused uh, some confusion among some people who thought, well, the governor says it's okay now, so I can go into a business that still requires people to social distance and wear a mask, and I can not wear mine because the governor said so. And um, I really don't know who to blame in this situation because it really is just a matter of a failure of good systems. Uh, there's not clear guidelines. And anytime you have fuzziness around the rules, people will take the most favorable interpretation of those rules for themselves and run with it and or in this case, swim with it. Yeah, you remind me, I think it was Milton Friedman who said that a a bad tax code that doesn't change much is preferable to a better tax code, at least in theory, that's changing all the time. Because you can adapt to something bad, but if it keeps changing, you don't know how to plan or how to spend or how to save. And that that hurts everybody. Uh, Bill, let's go to you. I love this story. Three life forms, quote, unknown to science, end quote, although I think they oversold that, discovered inside the International Space Station. The team investigated four different strains of bacteria found between 2015 and 2016 on the ISS and identified one of them. The other three were completely unique to mankind's scientific knowledge. Um, If they find a leathery egg up there, what are we going to (laughs) do? You've given me an opportunity to use the best picture frame I am ever going to get to say, I, for one, welcome our new bacteriological (laughs) overlords and would like to remind them that as a trusted member of the news media, I can be useful in rounding up other humans to serve in their underground sugar caves. I look for stories to set you up for Which is from Homer and Space episode. Orbital sugar Uh, caves. It's... it's, um, it's interesting. Uh, if it pans out, 
then what that I don't think that there's like they have like four different kinds of bacteria that identified one three they, they say they've never seen before. So I'm pretty sure that it's not like three alien bacteria came in from from somewhere that nobody knows about. But if it if this holds up, it shows that there that there are different evolutionary pressures on bacteria in zero G. And and they are and they are operating to such a high degree of selection that they are essentially mutating into new species very quickly by any standard of, of biological time frames. If 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 these bacteria, if the story holds up, then basically what they're saying is is that the, the and and it's I would assume it's zero G. I don't know what else it could be, but there could be some other uh, aspects to it. But if it's if it's the case, then that's a whole new wrinkle into things. Yeah. If if it turns out that three or four years of zero G is enough to mutate a bacteria into a strain that is unrecognizable, then that's interesting news and uh, potentially dangerous news. I also uh, and, think, it, Bill, that it might be just because it's kind of a, a clean room that's floating around the planet in a sense, and the the narrow subset of life forms that are in there essentially reduces the background noise of all the life that we have down here on Earth, and maybe they're just be. finding things that they, they wouldn't find in the welter of life that's on the surface of the planet. Yeah. That's an excellent point. It could be It could be that these strains of bacteria don't survive on Earth given the ocean of bacteria that's out here that they're that they're either very weak or maybe they're just not motivated who knows in any event um in any event scott scott's got an excellent point there but in any event if if the story holds up for the fourth time i said that now that does show that there are going to be biological uh unforeseen consequences that we don't know about. And this is the kind of thing I'd like to find out before we are on a two year trip to Mars rather than uh, during or after. And we shouldn't rule out the emergence of a leathery egg. Exactly. No. Don't, don't. I'd rather, I'd bed. rather fight the leathery egg than, than a rampant bacteria strain, especially after this last year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank God it wasn't a virus. We have to shut down everything. Uh, Scott, let's go to you. Uh, oh, this story actually got me, which happens sometimes. Uh, those who commit hateful but non-criminal conduct could receive a visit from the New York City police. The mayor, Bill de Blasio, probably, certainly America's worst big city mayor, said, and I quote, I assure you, if an NYPD officer calls you or shows up at your door to ask about something you did, that makes people think twice, and we need that. End what a quote. Uh, Scott, all three of us, uh, we could probably be fairly des described as First Amendment enthusiasts. Do you think the mayor's familiar with it? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> in brief, in a word, no. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't even know what it means to engage in hateful but non-criminal activity, or rather, I should say, you know, in the schoolyard, I know when somebody's engaging in hateful activity that doesn't necessarily get them suspended from school, but I don't, uh, I don't see the relevance to law and law enforcement, and I certainly rebel against the notion that you should send police around to tell people that they shouldn't be so darn hateful. Now, that said, let me just say to everybody watching this program, don't be so darn hateful. <laughs> this is obviously about mask violations, though. I mean, that's got to be it, right? You think I so? mean, yes, absolutely. What else could it be? Uh, I don't uh, know. <laughs> Who? Well, I guess we could elect more communists and find out. <laughs> Please. Have a wider <laughs> data not. set. No, no, anything but that. Uh, oh, <laughs> here's another one of these stories. Bill, we really are living in Heinlein's crazy years. Physics professor wants to ban the term quantum supremacy. You can probably yes, guess why. That. Yeah. Uh, Professor mm. Ian Durham wrote that given the lack of diversity in physics and computing, the use of quantum supremacy, which refers to having a uh, the, the best quantum computer in the world, can come across as adding insult to injury, my question to you, Bill, is what insult? What injury? <laughs> Newtonian lives matter. 
I think they're referring uh, the, the quantum supremacy things got to do with uh, our quantum computers versus the ones that China are making. And they've been making some progress on that, those devious yellow bastards. <laughs> um, but we don't want to say anything that might hurt somebody's feelings. So um, what this is, is, is twofold, well, threefold. First of all, it's the infantilization of everything. That just needs no other explanation. The second thing is it's virtue signaling on the part of this individual who's decided that he's got a chance to, to uh, make a statement on, uh, on being with the in crowd. But more than anything, the reason that these things are so offensive is because they, is because they treat because they treat minorities like they're infants. This is essentially white liberals saying that people of color will have their feelings hurt mm. if they hear the term quantum supremacy and that a black physicist might give up his career in physics if he hears the term quantum supremacy because, you know, those people just can't handle these kind of things. It is the most condescending, racist, ridiculous, absurd thing. But ultimately, when you get right down to it, you really boil this down. What you got is, is you've got the progressives exposed as being the world's proponent of the white man's burden. In other words, it's up to us to police the language so that people who have different skin shades aren't offended and steered away from other areas of work because they can't handle the term quantum supremacy. It is without question the most destructive, most insulting, most embarrassing product of our age. And we see it everywhere, everywhere. All of this is about white people saying that, oh, well, the, I, uh, the, we, we can't say that because, because uh, non-white people might find that offensive. Like they're children, like they're infants, like they're soap bubbles, like they're, like they're not really people. And there's your answer. Indeed. Yeah, it just occurs to me that on a long enough timeline, every social and political trend becomes a Monty Python sketch. And we're in season <laughs> three already. <sighs> yeah, the season without John Cleese, the season that wasn't funny. Yeah. Yeah. Glad I'm not the only one to remember that. All right. Last headline goes to me. Oh, this is from uh, Jim Garrity over at National Review. He wrote a column on Monday called Still Waiting for the Maskless Texan Apocalypse. He writes, the seven-day average in new cases in Texas is a little lower now at 3,647 than it was before the mandate was lifted. The state's number of active cases is down to about 106,000. Seven-day average in new deaths in Texas is down to 82, and that's down from 114 just a few weeks ago. And Texas, by the way, ranks right in the middle of the 57 states for cases per million people and for deaths per million people, which is about roughly on par with Florida, which of course has been uh, much more relaxed than Texas has been for a longer period of time. So I just wanted to end this segment with some good news. We are beating this dang thing. We're figuring out something we should have figured out right from the beginning, which is how to protect our most vulnerable while letting those of us who are healthy and capable to go about our lives and our business on a daily basis. And now we just need to wake up the rest of the country. So let's get on that. And that'll do it for this week's lightning round. Thanks for so much for watching. I'm Steve Green for Bill Whittleton, Scott Ott. We'll see you next time.